Uh, all right, so uh, I'm an academic, uh, full-time academic, but also have a company called Meta Profiling, both in my research um, and, uh, and my work. I look at uh, ways of increasing innovation, increasing entrepreneurship, uh, mainly through uh, identifying people with entrepreneurial talent and trying to sort of facilitate the environment that they're in. Um, and I think, so what I'll be talking about today is um, a couple of trends really. Um, one is that innovation or increases in technological innovation is increasing competition, which in turn increases the need for innovation. Um, and I think in parallel to that, there is an interesting trend, which is basically that even though, or on the one hand, we have an increase for entrepreneurial talent, and on the other, there's quite a lot of waste of entrepreneurial talent. And I'll sort of uh, reflect on what we can do about it potentially. Uh, but let's start with a basic question. Uh, do we think that the world is becoming more entrepreneurial? What do we think? Yes? No? Yes? Well, I think it depends on how you define it. I mean, you're not going to quite understand what this is, but it's, you can see that it's a trend downwards in terms of the slope. This is basically startup rates um, from 1955 to 2013 in the OECD. So if we, if we talk about startup rate, then certainly the world isn't becoming more entrepreneurial, it's becoming less entrepreneurial. But if we talk about it from a different point of view, which I like to sort of define it, is the capacity of innovation and the speed of innovation, then the world certainly is becoming more entrepreneurial. And there are a number of different statistics for this. I've just picked uh, a, a few. This is McKinsey's, um, the value or the estimated value of disruptive innovation within the next 10 years, which is about $35 trillion. Uh, a year, and the interesting thing here is that innovation enables more innovation, so it becomes more exponential, or innovation becomes exponential, correct? Uh, and, um, you know, again, there are a number of different ways of looking at it. This is just global in, uh, innovation output in terms of patents, not the best measure of innovation, but we can see an increase um, of it. We can see it in R&D, another sort of metric for innovation. Uh, R&D increase, most, the, the interesting thing here is most companies who have invested in innovation, gain from it, reinvest in innovation, uh, and it's a sort of perpetual trend. Uh, innovation doesn't happen everywhere. Um, different industries will have different amounts of innovation, but generally when we look at the cross industries, innovation will increase in most places. And that obviously affects most people as well, so or it affects everyone in a way. It affects individuals, it affects organizations, and probably even nations uh, in many ways. I think what, what the main sort of change uh, uh, or the main impact that it has, uh, the change has had is this sort of notion of diffusion innovation, that innovation reaches us really fast, and that has obviously massive implications. Uh, so this is just uh, innovation reaching 50% of household penetration. So for the telephone, it was 70 years. For the radio, 28 years. For the internet access, 10 years. This is time span for innovation reaching 10 million users. Uh, for Facebook in 2004, it was 852 days. For Twitter uh, in 2006, it was 780 days. And for Google Plus in 2011, it was 16 days. Now there's some media th that reaches 50 million users in a day. Uh, so, so clearly the, the speed of innovation is increasing massively. And that has an impact on organizational designs, if you like. So now we have to sort of start learning to interact with uh, machines, robots, algorithms, whatever you want to call it. Some people fear that we will be out of jobs. Others say that robots will enable us to do better jobs. I guess it depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. But certainly, it's, um, things are changing. There's the gig economy that, uh, that's also sort of changing the business model a bit. Everyone is becoming a bit more like an entrepreneur. Uh, I don't know if you know Fiverr, but this is just a company where you, you can get anything done starting from $5, be it sort of designing a website, designing an app, writing an MSc project uh, for if you're a student. I'm not encouraging any students, of course. I think I've seen it, though. But the gig economy, you know, it's, um, it's also happening in highly consequential sectors. You can order, you know, doctors on a, like you order Uber, you can order lawyers. Uh, so it's becoming highly sort of um, prevalent in many different sectors. And I think it's enabled by the whole sort of rating economy. So we're being rated everywhere, right? So it started with Amazon and eBay, 
now it's sort of LinkedIn, it's Glassdoor, you have, you even get rated by Uber drivers, Tinder, you have Rate My Professor in the US where you're rated not as how good on, not only how good you are, but also how hot you are. Um, you can even be rated while you are dating someone and you can sort of get, you can rate the ratings of other people, how good the ratings were, et cetera. And this is sort of be making everyone being sort of more self-absorbed, self-focused, narcissistic, if you like, uh, which, uh, you know, in a way it makes you like your own brand or like everyone is becoming more of an entrepreneur. And this self-focus, this is just time saying that millennials are, you know, narcissistic and, and spoiled. I don't know what you think about this. Do you agree? No? Okay. I have some evidence, actually, that, that this is true, that uh, <laughs> people are... Uh, people are becoming more narcissistic. I think it's whole society, not just millennials, but, but it makes sense. Uh, anyway, well, another thing that's changing uh, massively, I think, is competition, right? So for organizations, people, of course, uh, the competition for people in order to compete with other um, people from the gig economy, other employees, but also algorithms increasingly. But also uh, for organizations, competing with startups from below, tech giants from above or organization, established organizations from above. Competition is increasing. We have very clear data on this. So time span, time span in the S&P 500 in, index has gone from 60 years to about 15 uh, or going down to 10. Um, and we look at uh, the uh, companies in Fortune 500, 52% of them have gone bankrupt, been acquired or ceased to exist since 2000. And there's this notion that uh, within 10 years, um, the, most of the companies in the S&P 500 will be companies we've never heard of. So innovation has increased competition, which has made innovation more necessary for organizations as well. And I can just sort of take a sort of hands up in the room. Uh, how many of you think that your company need, that you worked for or that you have will need to become more innovative to survive in the next 10 years? Okay, that looks like 95% or so. Uh, if you keep your hands up, actually, sorry to be asking you to do physical exercises, but uh, <laughs> uh, just keep your hands up. And if you agree with this one, again, keep your hands up. If you think that you have a, your company has a clear strategy, and I see sort of hands dropping. And if you're not, it's probably maybe because your boss is next to you or something. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, this kind of reflects most surveys as well. Most uh, companies will say that their success depends on innovation. That's not a new thing. Creativity has always been a survival mechanism. It's just more pronounced and more acute right now, I think. Uh, the, the interesting thing is this notion of that most companies seem not to know exactly how to do that. That's not completely surprising, I guess, because it's happened so quickly. This sort of uh, masses of innovation increase have happened so quickly. So in essence, what it, it leads to is this sort of implicit or explicit questions of uh, how do companies become more entrepreneurial, right, uh, more innovative. And if you, don't have a uh, you don't, if you don't have an answer to a question, what do you do? Ask Google, exactly. Um, so you can ask Google how to become more innovative. There are 74 million hits. Um, I looked at the academic literature. It's 16,000 papers on it. <laughs> Difficult to summarize very quickly, but uh, I'll try. So I'll, there are really two fundamental rules of thumb that we can get from the, as, as, at least the sort of peer-reviewed literature, if you like. Uh, and the first one is very simple that creativity, innovation, still has to happen by people. That's just a fact. I mean, we can talk about you know, you know, machines having, showing signs of creativity, but you're not gonna see a robot sort of pitching an idea in Dragon's Den anytime soon, right? So uh, creativity is combining information in new and useful ways, and the more information you have, the more creative you can be. Google has all the information in the world, but you can't really Google, give me a good business idea. Google is not even close to being able to do that. Information outside the human brain is useless, basically, for innovation. It has to be inside the brain to be useful. And there are big differences in people's ability to store information within the brain and people's willingness and ability to connect those pieces uh, of information in new and useful ways. So entrepreneurial talent is, in essence, normally distributed. So that's rule number one. Second rule of thumb is that 
regardless of how entrepreneurial your team is or your people are, if they have a manager who is kind of annoying and just doesn't like to hear about new innovations, they're not going to innovate. And this is what we call the innovation ecosystem. If you're not allowed, you don't have the resources, or you're not encouraged to innovate, you're not going to innovate. It's as simple as that. So the second rule is that we need ecosystem as well. So in a very crude way, innovation output is entrepreneurial talent times ecosystem. And that's an interaction effect there. So if you have zero in either, you're going to have zero innovation output. So no matter sort of what recruitment strategy you have, you can go and uh, you know, steal the employees of Google, Facebook, Tesla, whatever you want, all the talented employees. If you don't have the right ecosystem, it's not going to matter. Likewise, you can spend, you know, lots of money on decorating offices with giant teddy bears and golf courses, whatever. <laughs> if you don't have the talent, it's not going to happen. The final thing is a conditional element. All of this is, of course, relative and contextual. It's not absolute and general. So that uh, you, know, you will generally get people saying, OK, give people. To become more innovative, you need to give people 20% time off to work on pet projects, take risks, allow them to fail. But if you're a law firm, I would really encourage, you, you know, encourage your lawyers to take time off, fail, and take risks. If you're a law firm, what this means is simply that you need to have to become more entrepreneurial means you need to have slightly more entrepreneurial talent and ecosystem than your competitor uh, law firms. That's what being more entrepreneurial means. So really, becoming more if you want to be a, more entrepreneurial as a company, what you need to ask yourself is two questions. How do I compare to my competitors in entrepreneurial talent? And how do I compare to my competitors in entrepreneurial ecosystem? And I'm not sure that many organizations actually have the answer to this. Um, whether they've asked themselves this or not, I don't know. But for sure, systematically, very few organizations have looked at it. And, um, and it's not easy, of course. I mean, first of all, how do you even know what entrepreneurial talent is? How do you look at it? Do you observe people's performance? Do you interview them? What do you do? How do you even define it? Right? And so this is, I've spent with my colleagues almost a decade on that question. Um, and obviously, I can't sort of impart that knowledge in, in a few seconds. But, uh, but a few insights I'll share. Um, first of all, what do you think 70% of entrepreneurs have in common? Prepare to fail. Prepare to fail? Anything else? Well, they actually fail. Uh, I don't know if they're prepared or not, but they actually, 70% of <laughs> entrepreneurs fail. 90% of entrepreneurs never grow. A very, very small percent of entrepreneurs actually grow. Even, only 2% of entrepreneurs ever want to innovate, let alone innovate. So in essence, what this means is that if we look at, in essence, it means that most entrepreneurs aren't very entrepreneurial. Okay? And if we want to understand entrepreneurial talent, we can't really look at entrepreneurs. We need to look at people who engage in entrepreneurial activity more often and more potently. What is entrepreneurial activity? Crudely defined, or the most established definition really of entrepreneurship is the recognition and exploitation of opportunities to create value and innovation. This is sort of roughly defined. And that's how we kind of define it and measure it. Um, and of course, this is sort of capturing, uh, this is a very broad definition. It's capturing a lot of things. So you need a lot of things to be able to do these things. So to recognize valuable opportunities, you need to have knowledge that other people don't have or recognize new patterns in the information that other people have. And that means, from a behavioral perspective, actively searching for new innovation or gathering new innovation. To, to exploit opportunities, you need not only action orientation, but you need to be uh, able to plan things in advance. You need to goal focus. To create value, you need to also uh, have a desire to create value, not just think about you know, how can I make the next buck. So it's future orientation, it's thinking big. To innovate, you also need to think. Uh, originally, you need to challenge the status quo. You need to um, challenge established norms and want to think uh, differently. I mean, again, I can't cover it. If you want to know more about the theoretical background, I encourage you to buy a few copies of our uh, handbook on entrepreneurship. <laughs> Um, I mean, this is all theoretical, but in essence, if you, if you understand what you are looking for, it's much more easy to measure that thing at, in order to identify entrepreneurial talent. And that's, we've done that for the last sort of nine, ten years now, where we've partnered with other universities and other corporates, and we've um, gathered a quarter of a million sort of uh, profiles, looked at how they relate. And with machine learning algorithms, we're able to identify it 
uh, with a fair bit of accuracy. This is just uh, identifying high impact entrepreneurs in a Brazilian sample of 9,000 people in 32 cities. We're also able to uh, identify that this is to a certain extent dispositional entrepreneurial talent, um, even if it's not completely deterministic. Uh, but of course, identifying entrepreneurial talent is only the half of the story. I think the other half is what, how to keep them. So if you don't actually have an ecosystem, like I said, it's not going to happen. So uh, we, this is just a recent paper that we did on uh, what, uh, when and why entrepreneurial employees want to quit their jobs. So we look at entrepreneurial employees, we see that they are actually more engaged naturally or dispositionally, but they're more also likely to think about creating their own business. Which means that when they're disengaged, they're far more likely to quit than other employees. And that means it's critical to look at the entrepreneurial ecosystem. There are many sort of uh, frameworks of it. Ours just focus slightly more on the culture aspect of things, the entrepreneurial mindset of the organization, because we believe that leads to the, to the rest of the uh, things. So really to look at um, your ecosystem as an organization is critical, and that's, as I said, relative to other organizations. So you need to ask yourself questions such as, uh, you know, leaders in my organization, all of this. And, and in essence, when you look at it, all these questions is relative to other competitors, right? So how do you do relative to other competitors in your organization? And we have some evidence that this goes, innovation and engagement in a way, go hand in hand. So the more um, innovation and entrepreneurial talent you have, the more innovation you have, but also high engagement. Whereas if you have just one of those, so if you have high entrepreneurial ecosystem, you get engagement, you get but only modest innovation. And if you get entrepreneurial talent right, you get modest innovation. But if you don't have the entrepreneurial ecosystem, you get low engagement uh, and high turnover interest. Um, fundamentally, though, I think on average, organizations aren't doing this uh, very well. And I think you don't need just uh, these figures. Uh, you can just look at sort of Google My Manager and, and it becomes clear. Uh, but this is, this is obviously quite bad, I mean, because that means also that entrepreneurial employees are disengaged and far more likely to leave and start their own, which leads to a dangerous rise of entrepreneurship. I love this title. I wish I came up with it, but I didn't. Um, in essence, it's dangerous because the likelihood of failure as an entrepreneur is very large. And if you survive, you're likely to be underpaid and overworked anyway. Okay, so um, in a way, failure to innovate or failure to value innovation within organizations is not just bad for organizations, it's bad for everyone pretty much. This is what I call the waste of entrepreneurial talent. So failure to value innovation uh, within organizations leads to disengagement of entrepreneurial employees. On a national level, it actually leads to more unemployment. In either case, this is more likely to lead to startup activity, which actually is not a good thing, even if you've heard otherwise. Um, Countries with more startups tend to be poorer. Uh, and the chances in a startup to innovate is extremely small. And the chances of failure is extremely large, with the, which then leads to sort of either going back to employment or unemployment, which then is a vicious circle, basically. So for everyone's benefit, you know, we need to do better in terms of uh, managing entrepreneurship. Uh, for established organizations, I think this means doing better in terms of identifying entrepreneurial talent, but also placing that talent in, in the right uh, ecosystems as well. Whether that's organization-wide or in silos, it's probably context-specific, but in essence, matching entrepreneurial talent to entrepreneurial ecosystems uh, will be critical, not only for innovation, but actually keeping those entrepreneurial employees from quitting and starting their own, which is Bad for, uh, bad for everyone in a way. And I think governments need to do more as well because you know, statistically when we look at it, a lot of entrepreneurial talent will be, uh, will be underperforming or failing uh, as entrepreneurs. So rather than encouraging more people to become entrepreneurs, governments need to start thinking about ways of maximizing the performance of those who are existing as entrepreneurs. This is a project that we are doing currently is basically trying to identify under, underperforming solo entrepreneurs and try to match them strategically into teams so that they can compensate for their own individual deficits and, uh, su uh, and succeed on a collective uh, in a collective way. There are probably many other things that you're going to, I just think that uh, we, we need to start thinking about it slightly more systematically so that we can utilize uh, the benefits of creativity and innovation better, hopefully for 
the better of everyone. Thanks. <laughs> All right.